I'm going to start by introducing our panelists, and they are Josh DeWald, Senior Engineer at StackPath. Andrew Stein, Chief Architect at Distill Networks. <laughs> and uh, I have to have this decoded. Nick Sullivan, Head of Cryptography at Cloudflare. <laughs> I'm going to briefly introduce each of our panelists, and they'll have a few remarks, and then I'll go to the next one. And then we'll have some questions for each of them, some questions from all, for all of them, and some questions from you guys. So please prepare your questions. Anything that you have to ask or want to know about CDNs uh, or related technologies, please ask all, all the way through to cryptography, handling thousands and millions of users with Nginx and so on. So I'll start with Josh. Josh started at CDN almost five years ago, and that's now part of StackPath. And he's mainly responsible for provisioning which means taking the customer configurations, which are very often Nginx configurations, and translating them into the form that they can use on their, webs on their edge servers. And he also works closely with their support team dealing with customer questions. And as you can imagine, since everyone and their brother uses a CDN these days, support is a vital part of what they do. Uh, so, Josh, if you'd uh, fill us in a bit on the picture from StackPath. Sure, yeah. So, as you said, I came from Max CDN. Um, where I work on the provisioning side. And StackPath itself w came about from uh, Lance Crosby, who started SoftLayer. Uh, and he sold SoftLayer to IBM. And uh, SoftLayer had a bunch of cloud customers, and they were all uh, complaining that, that security wasn't uh, native to the cloud. It wasn't built in. And so he started StackPath with the idea of having security integrated into applications as closely as possible. Uh, had got $180 million in funding. Uh, and as part of that funding was purchasing um, MaxCDN, uh, Fireblade, which is a WAF company, um, a, uh, and also uh, Highwinds was a recent acquisition. And so the hope is in the next uh, 12 to 18 months, we'll have a lot more uh, security integrated products other than CDN uh, integrated WAF. All right. All right. Cool. Thank you. Um, Andrew is a reformed data scraper, which is actually what I want to hear more about. <laughs> and uh, he now spends his time on Distal Network's bot blocking technology. So with a focus on speed and effectiveness, now I don't know if that means Andrew or Distal Networks or, or what. Somebody's focused on speed and effectiveness. <laughs> and Andrew's making sure that billions of requests are served to humans and that the bots all get blocked. So uh, Andrew? Yeah, so about six years ago now, uh, myself and two co-founders uh, realized that there was this huge gap in, in the security market uh, for bot detection. Basically, people were setting up WAFs and other security solutions trying to kind of solve this problem one-off and not using any sort of holistic tools or technologies to actually block bots. Uh, so we sat down, myself, uh, former Scraper, uh, our CEO, a former... Or, well, still current, I guess, salesperson, and our uh, CTO now, a networking guy, we sat together and we built a secure CDN that helps companies uh, prevent bot attacks um, from everything from fraud to price and data scraping. All right, and now we have Nick Sullivan, who's head of cryptography at Cloudflare. And that's, of course, on a, on a major, major CDN, that's an important job. It's probably... Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if Nick has had some jobs that he can't tell us about, because uh, cryptography is pretty, uh, pretty important in a lot of different areas. And he's run projects like Keyless SSL, TLS 1.3. Uh, before that, he did rights management, worked on the iTunes store. He has an MSc in cryptography and has a number of patents. So your company may be paying him money even as we speak here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably not. It's probably all for Cloudflare. And he speaks at major security conferences and uh, broader conferences like this one. Uh, Nick? Yeah, thanks for having me. So Cloudflare is pretty well known to be uh, <clears throat> a company that helps protect web services and web websites from attack. And it also uh, it provides the traditional CDN technologies, such as caching, web acceleration, things like this. So Cloudflare considers itself an edge network where uh, it leverages the fact that Cloudflare can be closer to your visitors to uh, 
provide not only security, but performance and visibility uh, type of services. And Cloudflare's been around for a while. Um, I've been there for the last four years, focusing on security aspects of the product. Okay. All right. I'm going to ask this question kind of in layers, so just uh, kind of brief answers to the different parts, and we'll build it up. How do you use Nginx at your, uh, at your company? Uh, so for us, it's, it's in our edge. It's on the edges, so it's at closeness to the users. We use it for SSL termination. We use it uh, caching in those edges, but also in our Shield product. We also use it in our app server, as, as many people would use with, with uh, PHP. Um, and it's also used in our WAF product. Uh, uh, with the Lua module. Uh, now, some of you may recognize Andrew because he stepped up a couple of years ago to do a case study for us. So we have a gigantic picture of him on our website. <laughs> so if you spend any time on our site, he doesn't actually own or run the company. He just is a case study guy on our website. <laughs> How do you guys use Nginx, Andrew? I mean, now I just feel a little kind of poured <laughs> out, honestly. <laughs> um, so we use Nginx as a reverse proxy, uh, primarily so. We tend to sit in front of our customer's traffic, decide whether it's a human or a bot. If it's a human, we let it through like any other reverse proxy would. If it's a bot, we're able to use the Lua module and formerly the Perl module uh, to sit in the way and block the traffic uh, or handle it however our customers want. And Nick, how do you use Nginx at Cloudflare? So Nginx is a pretty fundamental technology that is used throughout Cloudflare in many different places. Uh, Cloudflare as a reverse proxy, uh, as, as has been mentioned, is a very popular and common use case. Cloudflare is constructed uh, in terms of a la several layers of Nginx that take care of different uh, aspects of your website protection. Uh, there's the SSL layer, there's the kind of business logic layer, and there's a caching layer. And uh, Cloudflare handles somewhere, uh, at least these Nginxes that we, that we have, these Nginx instances, handle over a trillion requests per day. And uh, over, we have over 100 locations around the world. So um, not only is Nginx used for handling uh, handling requests that are going to go to our customers as uh, origin servers. We also use it uh, to build what's called a virtual backbone between our data centers. So between our 100 data centers, we have, using Nginx, this system that connects them together in order to accelerate requests faster than they would typically go over the internet. Um, Nginx is also used in our application infrastructure for our kind of basic uh, front end for, the, for Cloudflare.com, if you're going and changing your settings, that's managed by Nginx, but also for our data processing back end. So we have uh, a microservice architecture that runs on uh, Apache Mesos, and we use Nginx as a load balancer in front of that, as well as handling uh, credentials and, and things like this. All right, cool. I'm going to ask you guys, and, and we haven't rehearsed this because we just introduced these products over the last couple of days, so the answer might be not at all. But let me start with uh, our controller product, which, is, which manages, uh, will, will be managing, because we're still in beta, will be managing large installations of uh, Nginx reverse proxy servers. Do you, guys, do, do you see a role for that in your guys' setup? Uh, we could certainly you know, use it in our application layer. Um, also, we have um, internal uh, WebSocket proxy that we load balance WebSocket proxy that would certainly, I would think, fit into. So definitely in our where we use Nginx in a more traditional uh, application delivery, uh, okay. it, it seems like absolutely like we would fit into our you know, development staging production oh. um, uh, pipeline. Absolutely. All right, cool. How about you, Andrew? Yeah, I think anything that helps with management of servers, uh, especially in the like, CDN space, is a, a welcome improvement in okay. any way. All right. <laughs> and how about for you guys, Nick? Uh, it, it depends. We'll have to, to take a look. There's a lot of competing uh, technologies in this space, but um, I think management of large fleets of Nginx is something that we do need. So yeah, we'll look yeah. into it. All right. And then the other, the other product that we introduced is um, a, an open source offering that you can actually get to now through GitHub just as of, as of this conference, is Nginx Unit. And Nginx Unit is, uh, takes care of a lot of the application server work and builds it into the networking layer and combines those capabilities. It'll, of course, grow from there in the months and quarters ahead. Uh, do you get, see a use for, for a unit in your guys' uh, layout? Uh, I think it'd be the same. So our apps team, um, so I, I'm working on the delivery team, so the apps team would, would make the decisions. So currently, we do the standard um, you know, FPM, so 
uh, if they would see that and, and that it's nice because it's Nginx itself. Uh, it makes like it could be a useful product there, but uh, yeah. couldn't say for sure. Well, you've had about six hours now. To <laughs> <laughs> so. I, I sense it on our internal Slack. I definitely, we definitely linked on the Slacks. <laughs> all right. And about you, Andrew? We, we've done all the research. We've dived in. Um, so for us, um, it's helpful to me personally for like side projects and things like that. But since we are primarily a reverse proxy, um, controllers the far more like controller than engine WAF or however it's branded is. Um, tend to be more things that we're, we're interested in. Right, right. And Nick, do you see a role? So as I mentioned, we have a back end that uses Apache Mesos and uh, tons of different single-use applications, a lot of which are in Go. So one of the interesting things about Nginx Unit is that it does support other languages, Go being uh, a primary one. So I'm interested in that. Yeah, thank, thank you. And, and one of the things about new announcements like this is that Everyone will have their own specific needs, and until, until the product in question has the feature that you need, you know, you just have to hold off on, on evaluating it. I know, so it's a slow process, but it should be fun. Um, let me take a couple of questions from the audience, and if we have a lot, we'll keep going with that, and otherwise I, I have some more questions from uh, a couple of sources from before. So um, any questions out there? I can almost see you guys. Yes, uh, we have a microphone, a roaming microphone that's roaming toward you as we speak. Yes, great, thank you. I have a simple question. It might, it might not be so appropriate, but it, it's kind of an interest to me because we're currently in the middle of building our own CDN. Um, and that is how you came to decide on the technology choices you have. So specifically in Distill's case, because I'm familiar because we've looked at your, your product as well, is how did you come down the Nginx route? What, what, what other considerations did you have? And, and, and basically, how did it come about? Well, we'll start, with, we'll start with Andrew with the question, how, did you, how and why did you make the technology choices you did, and especially with Distill around Nginx, but others as well? Yeah, so for, primarily for us, when we started, we knew we needed something fast, because uh, as big a problem as bots are for websites, slowing your website down is, is even a bigger problem. Right? So we basically needed something that was fast that could sit at the web server level because we knew we wanted to intercept all traffic because it's really the, the best way to solve the issue. Um, and then at that point, this is six years or so ago now, so it came down between the two big players of Nginx and Apache. Uh, Apache was pretty much a non-starter. And then uh, Nginx gave us a lot more flexibility. Uh, at the time, it was primarily with Perl to be able to extend out write custom rules that we needed to, um, and then just really use as many features that were sort of out of the box in Nginx um, that we either didn't have access to in Apache or didn't want to have to use some other. Uh, basically, the, it was helpful that we could do so much within Nginx without having to go to like six or seven other different technologies and try chaining them together. And we could just do most of what we wanted uh, within Nginx and then extend that out uh, when, the case when the case arose. And Josh, I'll, I'll put a little spin on this question for you. Um, first of all, how you made the choices you did, and second of all, with changes in ownership, has that brought anything new in technology? Um, so, yes, yeah, so uh, I actually asked our, the Max CDN founder, Chris Uland, uh, about this, because they chose Nginx before I came in. Um, so he came from a hosting background, a shared hosting uh, background. He, they want to make sure they chose a product that was fast and easy to configure because they needed to be able to basically very quickly provision and Nginx did that. Um, it, at the time, especially, yeah, this is five, six, seven years ago, uh, it was releasing features very quickly. Uh, it was already known for being incredibly fast since that was its, uh, I think it came about because of essentially how fast can you possibly make a single web server. Um, and no, like we, coming into to, uh, StackPath, they fully uh, were, were happy with uh, our choice there. And so that's been, um, and again, with Fireblade, so Fireblade was a perfect uh, marriage for us because they, uh, they used the, the little module with Nginx reverse proxy as well. So, okay. yeah, it was a, a, a great combination for us. Okay, and how about at Cloudflare, Nick? So Cloudflare decided on using Nginx before my time, but uh, historically, 
Cloudflare was founded to be a security company. It's supposed to take your web property and protect it from things coming in, and it sort of accidentally became a CDN because uh, the caching in Nginx was so effective. And um, the, the most important choice I think they had to make, or the most important determining factor was, uh, as was mentioned by both of, the, both of these gentlemen, is, is speed and performance. And Nginx uh, is able to handle quite a lot of requests and do so very reliably. And uh, if there's a problem in your stack, it's often not going to be Nginx. It's going to be something else. Uh, just a question that occurred to me as you guys described your architectures a bit. Uh, is the number of hops that you have internally a big concern in terms of latency versus get, just getting information over the wire to and from the web, uh, Josh? Um, so generally, we don't have a lot of hops, but that would be um, so anytime we decide that we're going to add a layer, like say a load balancing layer or um, you know the WAF layer, that's um, we've definitely tried to minimize that as much as possible because Nginx, as I said, is, it's kind of never itself uh, the problem. So we try to, like if we're going to add, if something looks like it's going to add a few milliseconds, it's definitely something we'd back away on uh, yeah. if, if necessary. But we try to reduce the number of hops as, as much as humanly possible. How about you guys, Andrew? Yeah, I mean, anytime you're operating a, a CDN, the number of hops matters, where the data is coming from matters, and however you can optimize that is kind of crucial, especially if... When you're operating a CDN, people are expecting you to be fast. So if you say, well, we've got this CDN and we can cache it, but it's going to take longer than if you just went to your origin directly, that's, it's kind of a non-starter yeah. uh, for business as a whole. But same for you, Nick? Yeah, I think there's sort of three sides to the story of latency. You have uh, the eyeball traffic to your network and how to sort of optimize that. And uh, some of the new web technologies that have, that have come along, including HTTP2 and uh, upcoming TLS 1.3, are ways to reduce the number of round trips that you have between sort of the eyeball and your network. And then inside your network, it's, there's also, you know, if you have multiple layers of, of things, you have latency added by each, each step. So uh, we, we've made some strides to sort of collapse things together, and uh, the modularity of Nginx has been very helpful for this. Uh, it's having a lot of dynamic changes. Uh, it's important to be able to do that without having to reload your web server. And so the OpenRSD and Lua extensions to Nginx have been great for that. And then the latency between your network as a CDN and the origin uh, is also very important. And uh, this is something that we've leveraged, as I mentioned earlier, our virtual backbone uh, to go basically add additional hops uh, but do so in a way that finds sort of the fastest route across the internet. So uh, you can kind of trade latency per, for uh, performance, or hops don't necessarily add latency, but uh, if you're inside of a data center, you want to reduce hops as much okay. as possible. All right. Th thank you. Uh, is there another question from the floor? Uh, yes. Yes, please. Aiden? Thank you. So um, obviously caching in a, in a large CDN, you guys are, are scaling that, that cache much larger than you know, some individual you know, company would have to scale. Um, but when it comes to that scaling and hitting th thresholds for performance, are there certain metrics when monitoring Nginx from a caching perspective that are you know, critical to, 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 to scaling and making sure that you, you know, maintain that, that performance of the cache? So the question had to do with the uh, perform with caching performance and and, and the, the metrics that are critical to monitor. Oh yes, uh, yes. So what metrics caching. are you guys all over in order to monitor this, so the people here at home can uh, do some of the same on their on their installations? Uh, so for me, I'll admit this is not my expertise, but um, our systems guys. So they heavily monitor. Uh, so we use um, uh, Grafana, so we see. Uh, get metrics out of our, our servers. Uh, so we're monitoring um, disk write um, operations. Um, uh, I await a lot. Um, so in, especially with Nginx, because of the way it operates, you can end up waiting around for things other than the disk. And, and a lot, you're spending a lot of time waiting around for network. Um, uh, obviously, cache usage itself, which I guess would be the obvious one, just percentages of, of disk space usage. Um, and we use SSDs everywhere, so the actual uh, sort of we don't have the normal spinning disk issues there, but um, uh, I guess whatever the, the, the definitely the 
your systems engineers would, would tend to around disk space usage. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we definitely have to monitor disk usage in particular because we tend to serve uh, cached content out of RAM disks. So if that fills up, we're kind of sunk. Um, a lot of it is honestly working with customers on making sure they have the proper caching headers set because it's so often like, hey, we've got all this space for cache, like, but hit and miss rates are awful. And it's like, why? Well, they have the wrong caching headers set. Or it goes the other way, and the customers cache everything, and they shouldn't be. So a lot of it's just engagement with kind of your customers as a CDN to help optimize for hits, uh, which cut down, cut down, cuts down time for them and just latency as a whole across the network. Yeah. Yeah, I think cache ratio is, is the most important thing to, to look for. If you're looking for macro bugs or things that are affecting your system <clears throat> in ways that you may not notice right away, uh, if your cache ratio gets inverted, uh, which can happen, Somet sometimes things are seriously wrong. And we've been in situations where certain locations, cache ratio is n definitely not as good as it should be and have discovered kind of issues and had to debug issues with regard to uh, large files versus small, small files versus uh, downloading large files in networks that have uh, high packet, packet loss and, and things like this. So from, from the high level, I would say that the, the most important thing is, is, is your cache ratio what you expect it to be? And if not, um, there's probably a problem. If I can just add to that, actually, that remind me. So one of the issues around that weird usage is, is Nginx will, by default, buffer. Like, so if you do have, if you're doing large origin fetches, by default, Nginx will buffer that response uh, to, to memory and then to disk. And so you can, you have to watch out that maybe your cache space isn't filling up, uh, but you're actually ballooning up your temp space um, with, with um, in-process uh, downloads. So you, you can see that if people seem to be blocking on requests, but that's going to use up your temp space. So you can watch that with them. Uh, cache locks and, and disabling uh, buffering if, if you don't think that that's even appropriate for your use case. Yeah, this, this brings up a question that we had, had originally uh, for Cloudflare, but I, I think uh, everyone might have a comment on it. But I'll start with Nick. How do you handle deploying uh, new releases of Nginx and other technologies that you guys use in your stack so that they don't disrupt service? Uh, yeah, well, the, <clears throat> deploying Nginx or deploying different services, uh, you want to have a very like a, a de development environment that reflects what's in production, so you can have a battery of tests that, that runs through it. Uh, at, at Cloudflare, we have various levels of staging. We have uh, kind of dog fooding, which forces Cloudflare employees to go through early tests, as well as uh, some kind of canary places that only free customers' traffic goes through, and and upwards and onwards. So. Um, Watch the metrics, and if things are good, it and if the, the changes that you made, you have specific things to look for, uh, you kind of upgrade releases um, yeah. from more private like development environments to staging environments to production. And, and if you have the right amount of monitoring, then usually this can be a very quick process. Yeah, OK. OK, how about for you? Andy? Yeah, it's similar for us. Uh, you know, we've got a great ops team, which helps monitor everything. And then just going from uh, local development environments to staging environments to Canary and then worldwide. Uh, the nice thing about having a CDN is that if you have to turn off a pop real quickly and turn it back on, you have that ability. So there's a lot less risk in certain deployment uh, styles. Though in general, it's all. Um, can't think of the name, but all soft reloading. And when we have to do Nginx version upgrades, we can do basically that hot swap. Yeah, so that we don't actually, because there's nothing worse than taking someone's site down. Um, so everything we can do to possibly avoid that um, is pretty much game. And how about you guys, Josh? Uh, they mostly stole my answers. So um, <laughs> yeah, we have a, a functional test suite that we run. So it, basically, we treat both our software and engine, or our own custom software and Nginx runs through a, a functional test suite just to make sure that uh, a given set of configurations still produce the exact same result, regardless of the version. And if, assuming that goes well, we do the canarying and all, all the other stuff, and then oh. freak out if it's Germany. Uh, let me see if there is another question from the floor. Uh, yes, here, here in the back. And I think another one over here after. Um, it's actually kind of two questions, if that's OK. 
Uh, the first one is I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about your bot detection technologies. Um, as in, do you solely rely on things like CAPTCHA or do you try and do something a little smarter? Uh, and then uh, I feel like one of you mentioned that you use kind of a layered Nginx architecture. Um, if you could speak a little bit about the kind of logging and monitoring that you found useful um, for the interactions of the layers between themselves. So the, um, the first question was around bot detection. And so how do you guys uh, filter those guys out? Yeah, so it's a, for us at least, it's a, a multi-layered approach. Um, we have this sort of instantaneous detection that can determine right when someone's connecting, are they good, bad? Um, then it goes on to uh, short tail and then long tail analysis. Um, we offer our customers basically a bunch of different options. So if they say, hey, we want to capture this traffic because we think there's a possibility it could be a real person who's just accessing from a network that has like 99% bad traffic, like we can allow them to capture someone. We can put a block form where we can try and get some sort of validation that the person's real. Um, another thing that people tend to like is we can send that traffic back and just flag it as saying like, hey, we think it's a bot, so maybe now when they go to your pricing page, you don't show the price and force a login or something like that. Or just some other way of you letting the back end know that something may not be right so the customer can tweak the data they present uh, slightly. Now, I want to get an answer from both Nick and Josh on that, but let me warn you guys, too, that in, in a minute I'll ask you guys about interacting with the open source community uh, in your companies that have some highly proprietary stuff that you do. So I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. But Nick, how about you guys and bots? You, you like them there, right? Love bots. Bots are, <laughs> bots are great. Uh, there, there's a number of different things you can do for bots. Um, you can kind of think of uh, incoming traffic and how do you identify whether this is a legitimate user or not. Uh, you can use sort of meta information like IP reputation that was mentioned. That certain networks are, tend to have you know, higher densities of, of bad traffic. Uh, so we allow our customers to configure sort of levels of, of how strongly we challenge things. There's the CAPTCHA challenge. There's a JavaScript challenge as well that proves that you know, the browser is actually running. Uh, and then there's a, a number of interesting kind of t fingerprinting techniques you can do on HTTP in terms of looking at headers. Uh, TLS has some really great uh, distinguishing characteristics that bots have. So you can kind of look up and down the stack at a request coming in and uh, get, have, a, have a decent sense of whether it's a bot or not and, and make decisions based on how the customer configures. Uh, if you're worried about things like scraping, uh, we do content transformation. So. Uh, if, if you're worried about uh, some, somebody scraping your website and extracting different information from it, uh, we have something called the email filter. Uh, shout out to the email filter folks over there. Uh, <laughs> um, that it'll replace your email address on a page with an image and you know, various other things like this that make it more difficult for a bot to programmatically scrape your site. So uh, you can do content transformation, or you can actually look at incoming requests and, and make yeah. determinations. Now, Josh, I'm going to ask you about bots, and then I'll ask you about the open source thing first, because so that you're not always answering third. <laughs> uh. Uh, yeah, so our, uh, you know, our um, the the Fireblade technology uses all does basic user agents, IP reputation, uh, behavioral analysis that, that Nick had mentioned around. Um, essentially, is does the the mouse and, and browser behaving in a way that you would expect a human to be behaving, uh, and then it can uh, put them in a challenge mode with with. Um, uh, captures or uh, or watch them over a session, kind of make kind of watch their behavior uh, using our sort of offline analysis and um, uh, or put them in a monitor mode where at least it's it's putting in the logs. Hey, we think that that might have been uh, a bot, but a lot of those similar things as well. Yeah, I did some work with one of the major credit card processing companies, and some of the considerations were similar. Uh, they once turned off a country for a day because the volume of bad transactions from there was so bad and they needed to put in some additional filters. And I think kind of served notice to some of the people operating networks in, in country that they needed some help. So for, for a day, that credit card did not work in that country. Uh, so it gets pretty dramatic in trying to keep out bad traffic. So uh, Josh, let me ask you about open source. How do you guys keep in touch with the open source community? Um, so we, um, as a, even separate from the code, so we uh, do a lot of sponsoring of, um, so we host Bootstrap and jQuery. Um, so we do a lot of, with the open source community, just in terms of providing um, hosting, basically, bandwidth and, and um, 
you know, delivery. Uh, and then we also, since we're using Nginx uh, and um, Node.js, uh, so we're, as much as possible, we try to do, um, you know, if we have changes that we don't think are internal PRs, um, we're operating on the Nginx mailing list for, you know, we're, we're a customer of it in, in that sense, just as like any other developer. So we're in there in the mailing list, you know, uh, trying to answer questions, um, Stack Overflow type stuff, uh, you know, answering, and, uh, answering questions in Stack Overflow as much as possible. Um, and uh, I don't think we have any um, sort of um, cool Git repos that I can mention or anything, but um, that's definitely, we want to do more of that, of starting to push out that technology. But one of our uh, one of the speakers at the conference here, I'll, I'll let him identify himself later, said that he answered an Nginx related question, and it was kind of controversial. So it got on Hacker News, and he was then hired into his current job on the back of that question and answer. Um, how about you, Andrew? Do you guys do anything with open source, or you just ignore it now? No. <laughs> Oh, man. Um, yeah, so a lot of what we do is generally talks or hosting meetups. So uh, Distilled Networks hosts the DC area of Rust meetup. Uh, we've hosted OWASP events in the past and have people who actively try and contribute to those groups in San Francisco. Um, we talk a lot about the bot problems, how you can kind of at a very low level, very introductory, um, start to solve the problem and then understand why it is such a, a huge problem for people. Um, Code-wise, we're not doing a ton, but we're looking to make that change, especially as we get more, uh, more involved with the meetup groups. Yeah. Yes. And Nick at Cloudflare? Yeah, Cloudflare loves open source. Uh, we, we use open source all the time. As I mentioned, we do a lot of Go, so we've contributed back to the Go standard library and a bunch of different projects to do with uh, container security and uh, different security encryption products. We built a certificate authority called CFSSL. Um, on the Nginx side, we've been using Nginx for a very long time, and we've been doing some pretty innovative things where we were the first to do several things with Nginx, so uh, a lot of patches from Cloudflare have been upstreamed. Um, in terms of supporting open source in general, uh, CDNJS is one of the, the largest JavaScript uh, CDN websites that hosts um, <clears throat> all sorts of packages that you typically use on your website, and that's uh, supported by Cloudflare. Uh, so we, we've been involved in open source as much as possible, and, I, and we sort of believe that uh, nothing is too sacred to open source in, ter in, in terms of the CDN industry. Um, if, if it's something that's going to be useful for people developing servers around the world, and it doesn't, it's, it's not necessarily a competitive advantage to have this specific thing, it, it's, it should be for everyone to, yeah. everyone to use. And uh, that it can be a choppy process. Um, getting things into specific open source projects. You know, different uh, maintainers have different personalities and requirements and, and these sort of things, but... Um, no, we, no one at this conference. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a commitment, but I think it's, it's worth it in the end. If, um, if different people are building what are going to be the standards for the internet going forward, then uh, having them in a common code base or a, a actually in the upstream version of Nginx or other services like this, it's, it's uh, very worthwhile. It's a, good, it's a good case for some of you guys to make who get questions about open source back at your own organizations. Because you know, each, of, each of these companies has a lot of proprietary uh, IP. And so just you know, raising, raising the moat door would seem like a, a logical approach. But they're all going the other way as, as much as humanly possible. And I hadn't prepared them for this question. I kind of, <laughs> <laughs> kind of uh, hit them with it as, uh, as a surprise. But it, it's a great example to point to of people who have a lot to protect but also share a great deal as well. I think there was a second part to the question that we had from out here. And I, I only answered, uh, had us answer the bot part. Uh, the second question was about um, architectures where there's different layers of Nginx kind of talking to each other. Uh, and if you could speak a little bit about the kind of logging and monitoring that you found useful um, with that kind of architecture. We run oh, something right. similar, and it's something that we've struggled with a little bit. So any kind of wisdom or, or guidance you have there would be helpful. So this is logging and monitoring to help with communications across different layers of Nginx? OK, yes, please. Uh, let me start with you, Josh. Um, <laughs> we don't have too much of that, so I think that was uh, Nick, or Nick who had said that. So, but we do, uh, so for us, it's really we use, um, uh, we have a central logging platform that's an uh, internal 
uh, one. So everything's going through syslog to, to that. So in terms of, um, we don't have, uh, so one of the things is obviously you can use tracing uh, type stuff. Um, but largely, ours, for, for the use cases we have, it's really just the access logs. We don't um, have a huge number of, of, of the intermediate layers. So, Yeah, we're, we're also the same, where we don't have a ton of different layers. But the uh, access logs over syslogs and error logs over syslog has been great. Since in, in our field, traffic logs are vital. Right. In order to fully understand a website's traffic and actually help protect it, like we have to see everything. And so basically just being able to flush that out through syslog, then having Kafka and everything else pick it up. But it's, it's truly just one layer of Nginx is really all we've, we've had a use for. Yeah, we, we've had several layers of Nginx over the years, uh, fewer and fewer um, <clears throat> lately. But um, an important thing to keep in mind is, is tracing. So. Uh, if you have HTTP traffic that goes through several layers of Nginx, uh, having internal headers, making sure that your different layers of Nginx uh, strip the internal headers, uh, that can be very useful. And if you take uh, timestamps and, and these sort of things, if you have multiple Nginxes on the same machine or in different machines in the same data center, they can kind of help point out different bottlenecks. Uh, system level monitoring is obviously important. Um, if you have a caching architecture similar to ours, where you want to have uh, sort of a unique copy in a, every co-location or every data center, then you may have kind of east to west traffic inside your data center. And uh, keeping track of congestion inside the, the data center for large popular assets for caching is, uh, is something to really keep, the, keep an eye out for. Uh, I'll quickly mention, too, that Nginx's own tool, Amplify, went GA today. And so that means it's available for widespread testing and use. And uh, we, we welcome your guys' feedback on that as well. So one more question. Anything else out there? Uh, anybody have anything they've been dying to know? Uh, yes, please. So uh, sorry if it's a naive question, but um, uh, I, I understand that uh, you, you would use Nginx for your reverse proxy, SSL offloading, and everything. But is your whole caching architecture also based off Nginx, or are you doing something in-house or something else? Oh, good. No, that's a good question. So the question is, there's caching, of course, in Nginx, and we push that real hard. But uh, the question is, do you do additional layers, levels, tools for caching on top of that? Uh, let me start with you, Josh. Uh, we, we use the Nginx caching primarily, so we do also um, I guess I won't say other names, but we use other. Uh, we do use some other caching. No, that's okay, please. Uh, yeah, so we use on our um, one of our architectures. We use Varnish uh, as an in-memory cache um, and load balancer in front of, uh, and use Nginx in that case as an object store essentially, where 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 Varnish is generating cache keys and and essentially telling Nginx, uh, please go get this thing and store it under this key, um, and that's worked great for us for being able to to scale out horizontally. Um, but fundamentally, we're using the um, Nginx proxy cache um, with a shared cache. Um, yeah, and then we have uh, you know, purging modules and, and uh, other ways of doing purging. But yeah. yeah, we're primarily just Nginx, kind of out of the box um, for caching. And then, like you said, some additional like, purging tools built. Um, since like, being able to purge across a CDN is not exactly the easiest task on assets that are currently being retrieved. Um, so there's been a lot of work figuring out a purging strategy that actually makes it out everywhere quickly. So there's not this weird lag time where you're taking like five to 10 minutes in like New Jersey, but then the second you get to LA, that's a 15 to 20 minute purge timing. Mm. Yeah, purging is, is definitely very difficult. Uh, <laughs> getting, that, getting that going and making it quick is, is a difficult problem. And in, in some locations, yeah, you really have to think through your architecture to, to do cache purging properly. Um, uh, when it comes to caching, yeah, we use Nginx and Nginx caching, um, <clears throat> caching features. We have some uh, a sort of non-standard setup, but gen generally under the hood, it's, it's Nginx is caching with SSDs and uh, consistent hashing within a sort of set of machines. Well, usually it's hard to think clearly under the bright lights. So these guys have done a, an awesome job of tackling some tough and impromptu questions live. So uh, let's have a round of applause for our panelists. Thank you. 
and they'll be around this afternoon if you want to follow up. Thank you.